Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So thanks for joining our presentation titled Threat Hunting with Network Metadata. My name is OJ Wilanick, Sales Engineer at Flomon Networks. I'm joined by my colleague, Joe Krenson, who'll be assisting with questions towards the end. And just a quick blurb about Flomon. We're a network visibility company started in 2007 that's focused on uniting NetOps and SecOps for fast time to value. Flomon has over 1,200 customers across the globe from mid-market to carrier. The goal of this presentation is to introduce you to the benefits of network metadata and show you how you can leverage it in your own environments for finding, validating, and remediating threats faster than ever before. If you don't currently have a threat hunting program in place, we hope that our presentation is gonna inspire you to start one. So we love questions. Please enter them through the attendee panel on your screen and we'll address them, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as soon as possible, I'm sorry, uh, towards the end of the presentation. And lastly, we are recording this presentation, so we can send you a copy of it after the presentation is over. Let's go ahead and get started. So what is threat hunting? Threat hunting is a proactive approach to threat discovery. With threat hunting, you're assuming your network is under attack that malicious activity has already bypassed your traditional security system, such as a firewall, IPS, IDS, endpoint protection, et cetera. And it's just a, a matter of finding out the details so the threats can be stopped and then prevented in the future. So to be successful, you're gonna need a solution that is fast. Threats don't wait around and the sooner you find them, the better. You'll need a system where you can perform fast searches across structured data across all of your network devices. You're going to need a solution that's thorough. Threat hunting is all about finding the unknown, unknown threats that your firewalls, endpoint protection, IDS systems have already missed. You'll want to make sure that you've got a system in place to store, collect, and understand the information, all with minimal configuration. And as you add new systems, more IP addresses, more endpoints, more workstations, servers. You want the, uh, the monitoring to be automatic. And lastly, you're gonna need a solution that's efficient. You'll need a repeatable process that scales from those that are new to threat hunting all the way to advanced practitioners. Your platform of choice needs to scale too. So it's no surprise that Threat hunting is hard. It's something that's usually reserved for very experienced, very experienced professionals. And why is this? Well, you need to have a deep technical understanding of networking and protocols, the latest information on malware and threats, and of course, deep knowledge of an organization's infrastructure. Many IT professionals are already performing the job of two or more people. So it's not really practical for this to be heaped on them as well. You can you can imagine all this, this, this uh, leads to too few experienced practitioners. Um, it takes too long to develop experience, experienced practitioners if you need more, and it's too much data to look through. It just leads, this all leads to limited qualified personnel. So I think in the area of threat hunting, we can all use something that's gonna make our lives easier. So let's, let's, let's take a look at the major uh, threat hunting platforms. So I've, I've plotted out the major threat hunting platforms with respect to visibility, which is the amount of data and insights and granularity you can get versus the time to value, how quickly you can get these systems up and running and producing valuable information for you. So the first threat hunting system people can use or do use is Wireshark or, or full packet capture. This is the most basic form of network traffic visibility and it's purely reactive meaning you use it when something's wrong to perform a forensic analysis. With Wireshark, you can record raw traffic and replay or search through it, trying to find indicators of compromise. An indicator of compromise or an IOC is some trace left behind by hackers that shows you that they were there. This software is very inexpensive and is great for troubleshooting issues that you have a lot of information about already. It's typically not the case when you're looking for threats, right? So usually you're investigating traffic from a handful of machines at the most. 
you're definitely not going to be doing like a network wide search. The next up is a, is a SIM. A SIM is a, it stands for Security Information and Event Management System. And it's the next best threat hunting platform in terms of visibility and time to value. The efficacy of these systems is heavily dependent on how well they're gonna, they are set up and on their information sources. Essentially, you need to configure every information system in your network to send their logs, to send their events to the SIM, and then the SIM is going to then sift through all the data and tell you where your threats may be or what's important. If you have one misconfiguration, you're going to have a big disadvantage because you're going to be basically that's going to be a blind spot in your network. So due to the advanced correlation capabilities and configuration appetite, SIMs can also be quite expensive. The next threat hunting platform is is DPI or deep packet inspection. So unlike SIMs, these operate at the I'm sorry, unlike SIMs that operate at the application level, DPI operates at the network level, analyzing every single packet that traverses your network, including the payload. So imagine you're downloading your bank statement from your online bank. A DPI system will decrypt your encrypted session, revealing your username and password, and then obtain the plain text version of your bank statement. This is quite thorough, but as you can imagine, the processing power for decryption and storage space to store and analyze all packets can necessitate quite an investment with a higher time to value. And lastly, we have a NetFlow slash IP fix network metadata system, which is the highlight of today's presentation. So this is a lean and mean cousin to DPI. It operates at the network level like DPI does, so nothing's missed, but you don't have to configure endpoints like you do with SIMs. And instead of disabling encryption and storing and analyzing packet payloads, it ignores the packets entirely. The end result is fantastic visibility for a fraction of the cost and time to value. So let's take a closer look at NetFlow and IPFix. So with a, with a NetFlow slash IPFix network metadata system, you'll be able to comb through over 250 different data points covering layers two through layer seven. So you get this fantastic level of visibility without uh, reducing people's privacy because it's not gonna be decrypting payloads because it ignores the payloads. You'll have the ability to log and search IP addresses, but also have network application level visibility. This is really the holy grail of network metadata since it shows the, shows what you who the users are on your network what they're doing and how they're doing it without layer seven you're really just seeing um, ip addresses so again it's privacy preserving um and there are quite a few companies out there that um are are kind of negative on on netflow systems um, but they they typically are comparing netflow to netflow from 20 years ago um, which was just pretty much just layer two, but there's been significant advancements as you can see um, with today's NetFlow. So NetFlow systems and network metadata systems use about 500 times less data than a deep packet inspection system. And again, this is because it's ignoring the packets, I'm sorry, the payloads. So with 500 times less data, you've got faster searching and faster data pivoting. Data pivoting is, is simply starting from a known indicator of compromise and then pivoting out to um, unknown, unknown um, infections or unknown hosts, right? So you're starting with something you know and then, and then moving out, uh, branching out to find out all the implications of a particular indicator of compromise. And so with less data, of course, you can do this quicker. You have a smaller data set. Um, and now with all this, this very compact data, you can go back in time to see what happened three weeks ago or even longer. Um, to do that with a similar with a DPI system uh, could take significant storage and, and hardware to do that same thing. So with this visibility um, and compact data set, you've got a faster time to value um, and, and, and significantly less cost, less hardware, faster time to deploy, faster searching. On another note, on another, on another note um, your, your IT staff love fast and easy to deploy systems. So this is a great way to 
to make your, your staff happy. So where do you start with threat hunting? Like what, what, what typically do people need to do, right? So there are several information exchange databases or threat exchange databases out there. And what these um, databases do is they publish um, up-to-date information on the latest threats and how you can find them. They will tell you exactly what to look for in your network uh, threat hunting tools in order to determine if you have an infection of a, of a certain type or, or how to set up an alert so that uh, you'll be identified if that infection ever does crop up in your network. An example of that is, is, is from Microsoft. So a, a while back there was a, a, um, a threat that involved um, Microsoft Word, it was a Microsoft Word vulnerability. And that vulnerability was documented by Microsoft to contact a certain command and control server. So this is a server that controls all the infections. And the infection would also be uh, identified by a cer certain user agent string, which is part of an HTTP traffic transfer. Okay, so these are two elements that you could plug into a threat hunting system to positively identify if, if you do have that infection. Also, on the Microsoft uh, advisory, they described some suspicious SSL or TLS certificate fields that might indicate that you have a compromise, right, from this infection. So one of those was, a, was a, uh, an issue or organization called My Company Limited. If you were able to search your network for this, the use of this certificate or element in the certificate, you could, you could be pretty sure that you have that infection Microsoft is, is describing. So let's go ahead and do some, some hunting to see what it looks like in a network metadata slash IP fix system. So what, what you're looking at here is a, is a search query screen, okay? This is, what I've done here is I've plugged in a host name um, that is indicating uh, that this host here that we're looking at is actually a blacklisted domain. This is a domain that a command and control server um, might use, uh, or it might be a, a um, a source of known malware, right? So if anyone is communicating with this host, I'm gonna to wanna to know immediately. So I can just plug this host name in here and perform a search. And you can see that one of those hosts that did uh, try to communicate with this, this host name here is 192.168.3.225. Now I can take that host, the .255, and I can plug it in and I can say, okay, show me all the time, all the hosts on my local network that this infected host communicated with. So this is how I'm, I'm data pivoting, right? I'm, I'm starting from something known, which is this, this host, finding an infected host based on that information, and then finding all the hosts that this infected host may have also infected, okay? Um, Searching for suspicious TLS elements or SSL certificate elements is simple as well. Here I'm looking for a server common name, subject common name called mathtag.com. I just submit it and lo and behold, I can see every host in my network. And this is searching across weeks of data, right? And it just takes a number of seconds to do that. Maybe I wanna find old uh, TLS versions. TLS, anything older than TLS 1.2 is considered obsolete and easily easily uh, crackable. And so I want to make sure that no hosts are using an easily penetrated uh, encryption system, right? Um, so I can do that. Find me all instances where people are using TLS, uh, not using TLS 1.2 or 1.3. <clears throat> now I'm sure you you. Everyone here remembers WannaCry. It was a ransomware crypto worm with, and it targeted um, computers running Microsoft, uh, Windows and basically it encrypted the data, demanded ransom um, with Bitcoin, right? Um, 
It's also known as WannaCrypt, several other names. <clears throat> and so with a network metadata system, you could potentially search for any time a host tried to query DNS looking for the IP address of this host name. And the way, the reason why this would be a good query is because what WannaCry does is it, when you, when it installs itself, it tries to phone home to this host name. And if the host name resolves to an IP address, then the, the WannaCry worm stops executing. It's basically a kill switch. So as soon as someone registers this domain or registered this domain, WannaCry would, would stop, stop running. So this is a great way to plug this in and find out all the hosts that tried to communicate with this host. If they did, they've got WannaCry for sure. Now, if you don't have this level of visibility because not all network metadata systems are equal, you could look for port scanning done on port 445. So that's what this string is doing. WannaCry was notorious for performing port scanning. So the, on port 445, because this is the uh, SMB share port. Now this is not a positive, uh, you know, this is not as, a, as good of a search query as the first one, but it's as, you know, this is all about uh, narrowing down an ocean of possibilities to specific things that you can look for. Okay, so just a couple examples here. So, so what other what other fields are available to search on? Well, there's over 250 different pieces. With our with with uh, with this network metadata system I'm using, um, you you know the system can generate this from raw traffic. So you just point raw traffic to it. It will then generate all these different data points that you can then evaluate. Now. I keep talking about performance, right? And obviously sifting through 500 times less data is significant than, than with a, a DPI system, um, much less configuration um, than a SIM, and of course scalable, unlike a, 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 a Wireshark uh, application. So all of the queries that I showed you previously um, took roughly 30 seconds each to run, okay? Now that in itself is, Kind of hard to gauge, you know, if it's if it's fast or not. But that was looking through over over 107 gigs of raw traffic, which is composed of 120 million packets. Now you might say, okay, well, how fast is the is the appliance, right? Well, it's one appliance, and it's virtual, which we all know um, could have. Uh, it, it could have performance issues, right? If it's not spec'd up properly. But we also had many concurrent users running. This is actually the system, the, the, the implementation that we use to conduct public demonstrations, as well as all the sales engineers across the globe use this as well to, to conduct demos. So this is a small little virtual appliance and it's extremely capable, extremely fast. Um, this, this, this kind of performance would be very expensive in another type of system. So we've talked a little bit about how to find information that you're aware of, right? You, you subscribe to these threat exchange exchanges um, and then you can find some indicators of compromise, right? But what if you wanna find these things on an ongoing basis? You don't want to um, have to constantly perform searches, right? Well, you can do that with alerts and behavior patterns. Behavior patterns are extremely powerful. Um, here's some examples. We're detecting WannaCry here. We're de detecting TCP null packets. This is another indicator of compromise. So you can set these up in the application and be alerted whenever something suspicious crops up, okay? And of course, with any good any good system, we've got some nice dashboarding, right? So you can monitor these dashboards, um, looking for you know, and even look back in time at your network metadata to find past threats or even emerging threats. Mm -hmm. 
now up until this point i've shown largely i've shown what i've shown you is largely against known indicators of compromise and this is great but what about some more of the elusive stuff right so like zero day threats threats that nobody even knows about yet indicators of compromise that involve statistical analysis so could you find evidence of a dictionary attack or data exfiltration via dns yourself maybe but probably not and if you can de detect these things you probably can't do it 24 hours a day seven days a week so this is where machine learning is is going to come into play and this is going to allow you to extend your threat discovery window to around the clock even for the hardest events without increasing headcount let me show you what it looks like when you apply machine learning to your network metadata and take your threat hunting from visibility to automatic detection. So this is a, in this screen here, we're looking at evidence, we're looking at a horizontal network threat identification. So across the entire network for a particular segment of time, um, this system is showing you all the different potential security incidents um, and indicators of compromise and it's categorizing each kind of them so you could expand each one of these types of indicators of compromise and see um, you know who the attacker was and what machines they were attacking this is going to look at botnets and malware blacklisted host ddos attacks data exfiltration all that good stuff once you've identified these things in your network, which is again happening with statistical analysis and machine learning, uh, then you can go back and 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 uh, perform some mitigations. Uh, there are integrations that are possible, so you can trigger a mitigation in your firewall if you wanted. But the first step is really knowing with precision, you know, what's what's happening and with efficiency. So here's all the different. This is just a handful of the types of incidents that have been detected. So if we looked at if we if we drill down on this DNS query anomaly, uh, this is this is a an evidence of potential data exfiltration. So somebody, someone, or something is misusing DNS protocol to potentially steal data. And so how does the system know that, right? Well, what it's doing is for this particular attacker, the 0 0.66, uh, the system noticed that the number of DNS queries far exceeded the average for the network. Okay, so this is the statistical analysis that you might not be inclined to do yourself, right? Um, based on this information, the system's gonna say, okay, great, you've got something going on. Potentially some malware is, is, is pilfering data out of your network. And if we drill down on that event, we can actually see the evidence, the source IPs, the destination IPs, all the flows, the network flows, the network records that are evidence of that incident happening and the reason why this is valuable is this is a huge uh, this is a huge time savings your, your sea of uncertainty is now just a few cherry picked records that you can then go ahead and validate once you've validated that you can go yep um, this is a problem let's go ahead and shut the source ip machines down and that can be done either manually or you know with an integration but the key is really that that 24 7 discovery so I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the concept of, of kill chain. Um, and this is really, you know, th the concept of that, that malware typically has a sequence of events that it goes through from starting with data, um, sorry, with starting with reconnaissance or port scanning, if you will, and then moving all the way through data exfiltration or payload delivery, or maybe encrypting someone's database, right? So you'll be able to see things from a somewhat kill chain type view as well in this NetFlow system. So let's take a look. Uh, in this in this screenshot, what I've done is I've I've looked. I took that one host, the 3.225, that that had uh, some suspicious activity before, and I plugged it in and said, okay, show me all of the incidents involving this IP address emanating from this IP address, and then it's sorted by timestamp. So I could actually see the sequence of, again, of events or progress of an attack through the network just by plugging in a particular host. And you'll notice this is the host. The host is the same for every record because that's the host I'm looking for. 
This is the, the target of the attack. And then here's a plain language explanation of why this system decided that there was a certain type of anomaly that was happening. Okay. So when someone says, why is it happening? That's the reason. Very easy to see. So I hope through this presentation that you've seen that, that less is more, that NetFlow IP fix network metadata, metadata is rich, efficient, and potent. Machine learning supercharges your threat hunting efforts. And that network metadata deserves a place in your threat hunting tool set. So Joe, uh, over to you. Let's uh, let's take some questions. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Sound good. Okay, great. So we did have a couple questions. Let me sort through and sort of combine some that might make sense to go together. So the first one is, I guess you talked a little bit about mitigation. So the question is, does your platform provide any mitigation or what are the other next steps after finding a potential indicator of compromise? Great question. Yeah, so we do, the platform itself does not do mitigation. It's purely a network intelligence system, um, but integrations are, are, are simple. And we actually have on our website um, integrations that you can download. It's basically just script files um, that will talk to maybe a firewall um, and report the IP address that should be blacklisted. Great question. Okay, great. So the next one is, it's regarding regarding the application layer information. What exactly do you mean by that? So application layer is looking at layers above layer three in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the, in the stack, right? So, application layer is going to give you context for the communication the network communication that you can see it's going to tell you who is responsible for the network communication it's going to tell you which hosts are responsible for it um, and it's going to tell you the why what applications are being used is it web traffic is it encrypted traffic is it um, udp is it tcp is it is it dns traffic right and that's the context that you need to successfully find threats in your environment Okay, and then this one um, goes into the about the updating of our threat database. How often does your solution update the threat database information? And is it from paid or open source? Great question. Yep, so we, we use open source databases um, and some paid. And it's basically uh, the updates happen every six hours or so. And they, we, we, you know, Fullmont also pushes um, updates to behavior patterns, which are kind of on the fly signatures that we can push to the product. And then the databases also contain um, thousands and thousands of, of blacklisted hosts and command and control servers. So if any host communicates with those, that's basically 100% positive ID that you've got, you've got that type of malware in your network. Okay, cool. And then this is the last question, unless somebody types another one really quickly. What are your false positive rates? And is that different whether they're dynamic or static methods? Great question. Yeah. So there the the I'd say that it's a it's a, it's less than a five percent false positive rate. For the static methods, it's basically zero percent false positive rate, because we know that there's a particular element in your network based on that static detection mechanism. So one of the detection methods is is um, is VPN or encrypted traffic, like tunneled, tunneled traffic. Um, either it's tunneled or it's not. If it's tunneled, then obviously it's 100% detection rate. So you won't see a, a 0%, sorry, you won't see a false positive rate on that. Um, for more of, the, more of the esoteric detections, you're looking at less than 5%. Um, and just keep in mind that, you know, with false positives, it just just it it helps to put it in perspective, right? You're not involving headcount in chasing false positives, in generating and researching false positives because the application is doing it for you. So that's kind of a, a good thing about it. 
Well, that's it from the, the Q&A portion. Okay. Cool. Well, that's, um, that concludes the um, presentation. Um, and so I wanted to thank everyone for attending today. And please watch your email for um, a, a recording link that we're going to send out after the presentation. And we appreciate all of the, your attendance and any questions that you might have. Feel free to shoot me an email and I can do my best to help you out. Thanks for, thanks everybody and take care.